Hello, everybody, and welcome to Theology 101. Today, we will be continuing our verses series, comparing the views of dispensationalism and covenantalism. Now, I want to be clear that all these views are legitimate views within Christianity. These are things that brothers and sisters in Christ might fight over, but should not be a reason to declare one side heresy. The two views I will be comparing today is dispensationalism and covenantalism. Dispensationalism is a theological system that teaches that biblical history is best seen through successive dispensations. The word dispensation comes from the Greek word which means economy. So dispensationalism refers to how God manages or works in different ways during different periods of history. Covenant theology looks at salvation history through three covenants. The covenant of redemption, the covenant of works, and the covenant of grace. Today we will see a debate over whether the church should be considered the new Israel. Dispensationalism teaches that there is a distinction between national Israel and the church. Traditionally, dispensationalism looks at Israel and the church as two different trees. God planted Israel, but she bore no fruit. So God cut down the tree, leaving behind the stump and its roots. He then turned his attention to a new tree, namely the church. When the age of the church is complete, they will be raptured or taken up to heaven. And then at this point, God will turn his attention to national Israel again, and they will start to bear fruit. The church does not replace Israel, nor is the church considered the new Israel, according to dispensationalism. Instead, they remain two separate entities. Now, progressive dispensationalism agrees that there is a distinction between national Israel and the church, but they see a unified kingdom program from the Old Testament for both Israel and Gentiles. So when Gentiles get grafted into the roots of Israel, progressive dispensationalism argues that they join the people of God, but they do so as Gentiles and should not be considered a new Israel. Continuing the tree analogy, covenant theology agrees that Israel bore no fruit. But instead of cutting her down and leaving the roots and stump behind, covenant theology says that God uprooted this tree completely. And in Israel's place, he planted a new tree called the church. So all the functions and promises given to national Israel in the Old Testament are now applied to the church who was the new Israel. Traditionally, this view was called replacement theology, but modern versions of this view is now called fulfillment theology, since the church is a fulfillment of all the promises originally given to Israel. With this in mind, let the debate begin. When Adam, the covenant head and representative of humanity, fell into sin, all human beings became guilty of condemnation and death. Because of Adam's sin, all people became subject to the curse of the law and are born with a corrupt nature. Then God initiated the covenant of grace after the fall in order to restore his people and to have a relationship with them. While the covenant of grace was given in a variety of ways, there is a unified message that God redeems his people through faith in Jesus Christ. So there is no separation between Israel Israel and the church. The promise God made to Abraham in the covenant of grace, namely that he will be the father of many nations and through his seed all the families of the earth will be blessed, finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The seed promised to Abraham is Jesus Christ, the true Israel, and all who are united to him by faith are heirs of the covenant promises given to Abraham. Israel and the church are not two distinct peoples. Rather, the church is the true Israel of God. There's a lot I agree with what you said. I agree that God related to his people in a variety of ways during different periods. However, I do not think that those are different expressions of the covenant of grace, but different dispensations. I also agree that Gentiles are spiritual offsprings of Abraham if they are united to Christ by faith. But there are multiple meanings to the phrase seed of Abraham. Abraham's seed can refer to national Israel. Paul's quotation of the Abrahamic covenant shows that individual justification is included in God's blessings for both Israel and Gentile nations. Old Testament prophecy sees also affirmed this expectation by giving pictures of Israel drawing nations to Jerusalem in God's kingdom. The seed of Abraham can also refer to Christians. Paul presents a unity that exists between Jews and Gentiles because of the Holy Spirit. However, this unity does not replace the functional distinctions that exist between Israel and Gentile nations. Finally, the seed of Abraham can also refer to Jesus. Jesus blesses the nations with salvation as the light to the nations. He is the Davidic king who administers blessings to both Israel and Gentile nations in his kingdom. So I don't agree with your reading of Galatians chapter 3, where Gentiles being labeled as the seed of Abraham precludes national Israel from continuing to be Abraham's seed. In fact, 
Romans chapter 11, verse 12 seems to indicate that the riches that the Gentiles are experiencing today while Israel is stumbling will escalate when national Israel is saved, implying that there is coming a time when God will save national Israel. During most of the Old Testament, there are essentially three groups of people, the Gentile nations, national Israel, and true Israel, referring to the faithful remnant within national Israel. Although the nation of Israel was often involved with idolatry, apostasy, and rebellion, God always kept for himself a faithful remnant. This remnant, otherwise known as the true Israel, included people such as David, Isaiah, Daniel, Sarah, Deborah, and Hannah. They were those who were circumcised in the flesh and in their hearts. So even in the Old Testament, not all were true Israel who were descended from Israel. Then, during Jesus' ministry, true Israel was most visible in his Jewish disciples who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Those who rejected Jesus were not true Israel, which included many scribes and Pharisees. Though they were physically Jews, they were not true Israel. True Israel became defined by those who are united to Jesus by faith. On the day of Pentecost, the true Israel was the nucleus for the New Testament church. Soon after, Gentiles became part of this group. The church is now the new Israel, since it is comprised of both Jews and Gentiles who are united to Jesus by faith. I agree with you that there's a distinction in the Old Testament between the faithful remnant within Israel and the rest of national Israel. I also agree that there is a unity that exists between Jews and Gentiles in the church today. However, this does not mean that the church fulfills the purpose of national Israel today. If followers of Jesus are Gentiles, then they have been grafted in and have been made part of the people of God. The problem with your interpretation is that you assume that God including Gentiles as part of God's people means that God is redefined or expanding national Israel. But this assumes that the people of God in the Old Testament only included national Israel, which is not true. Examples such as the mixed multitude that left Egypt as Israel entered the Promised Land, Moses' Midian wife, Rahab, a Canaanite woman, and Ruth, a Moabite widow, are all examples of Gentiles who are part of the people of God in the Old Testament. Later in the New Testament, the apostles decided that Gentiles can be included as part of the people of God without having to become an Israelite and can maintain maintain their national distinction. God was always concerned with Israel and Gentile nations from the Abrahamic covenant. So Gentiles becoming part of God's people does not redefine or expand national Israel since God still has a plan to save Israel one day. So what did you guys think? Which view did you find more convincing? We will continue looking at the differences between dispensationalism and covenantalism regarding their views over Israel and the church in the next video. If you want to study more about these views or find other recommended resources, I'll leave links below in the description box. Until next time, see you!